Hey everyone and uh, welcome back. I wanted to focus today on a short summary of what we addressed in our teaching talk number 31 focused on civic engagement. I want to thank uh, J.D. Solange, Elizabeth Loudon, Amber Tierney for uh, coming out and participating. I thought we had a really good dialogue and discussion. I'm recording this here still not knowing the outcome of the presidential election. We certainly talked about the issue of the election since we uh, had our conversation on November 4th on Election Day. But really in our conversations, the focus of civic engagement went well beyond getting students involved in uh, voting efforts. And certainly we have to commend the college for doing so many media campaigns and, and hosting a congressional forum, many other efforts as well ongoing that um, I think really indicate the important role that the college plays in terms of civic engagement. Depending on what happens with the presidential election, I was reading an article today saying what a Joe Biden presidency would mean for higher education. I think we'll see some pretty radical changes moving from a Trump administration, a Betsy DeVos administration with higher ed to a Biden administration and his um, potential upcoming secretary of education. Well, let's jump into what we talked about. And again, these conversations are very free flowing. We get a lot of uh, great um, focus on issues related to teaching and issues outside of teaching. Really encourage all of you to attend. Um, it's great to see people in these workshops. I know everyone is struggling with Zoom, but maybe going forward, when you see a workshop that you might connect with, and in particular, if you've never attended one of these workshops, give it a try, check it out, see maybe what you're missing, because I think we're having some great conversations in them. So these are the ideas that I charted as we move through our considerations. And not all of these relate directly to concepts of civic engagement, but I think in general, we talked about issues that maybe are also pressing because of COVID-19 and because of the political climate right now. So one of the ideas here at the beginning was this notion of challenging simplicity with complexity. So if someone says something, say in a social science class, and they have a very simplistic explanation of something, like immigration as an example. Can we use our information, our resources, our research, our data, our studies, peer-reviewed studies to not necessarily convince students of something, but to see that there is another opportunity to view the world in a different way. That's a key part of education. And maybe what I'll do is just as I go through these, I'll try to track uh, the ones I've talked about. Here's another one, and this is, I think, really connected to COVID. The effect of the virtual world on all of us. So we've talked about civic engagement prior to COVID-19. When you think about how challenging these times are, it's really important to remember that ourselves and our students are struggling. There's a lot of related to that collective trauma in the world and certainly mental health, our mental health, our students' mental health is really key and important to um, maintain a focus on. Student stress, depression, and apathy I think there's been a lot of upheaval in the world with COVID-19. There's certainly been a lot of uh, political discourse in the United States that is focused on really division and not bringing people together. So I think that's another side of this. So remembering all this, it's really important to say we have to be present for our students. Hopefully they're present for us. We have to think about flexibility and think about empathy as we've talked about in some previous conversations. As we think about maybe specific tactics to focus on because of the current climate right now, I'm thinking of social media, I'm thinking of the growth of groups that are specifically focusing on conspiracy theories like QAnon, totally unfounded and frightening and scary, kind of the fantasy land that they live in. It actually reminds me of a recent book called um, Fantasy Land that focuses on sort of um, U.S. proclivity, if you will, for paranoia, going back to Hofstetter's work in uh, the 60s about the paranoid spirit or ethos set of feelings in United States politics. And I think when you see QAnon and other movements, there is this emphasis on really taking things out of context on not focusing on some of these key areas. For example, we have information literacy we talked about and critical thinking, always a component of any class at LTCC, media literacy. So if students get information, part of civic engagement can be to say, make sure 
that they're very aware of what they're reading, any potential biases in their in what they're reading, and how to challenge assertions that are being made, um, makes me think of the value of say a class or a training in symbolic logic to look at fallacies and some of the other logical errors that we make often in making judgments about information. I mentioned QAnon. You know, certainly uh, cults and high demand movements are an example here of a trend maybe we see in the United States in terms of our social movements where there is a focus on not looking at facts, there's a focus on really creating um, very aggressive kind of counter discourses or relationships that are embedded maybe in um, hateful things or very aggressive things in terms of how people are trying to create a them or us attitude. So. Always, I think, a reminder just because of the political times we exist in now. Doubts about key institutions. I think certainly when we think about certain political discourse coming out of Washington, D.C., some of the key players in government have been saying things like don't trust the media, have been talking about fake news, have been talking about uh, you know dis- destroying or dismantling the courts, have been going after the FBI, the CIA, Justice Department, Uh, the feds in terms of law enforcement. So a lot of our students probably share in some of those doubts because like the rest of us, we watch TV and focus on media. So to really make sure we can have key conversations with our students about society, whether we're teaching a poli-sci class or not. Now, I think related to that is this idea of conversation. JD often talks about this deliberative dialogue to make sure that we're having true conversations in classes. If one student is dominating a conversation, and this is connected to civic engagement, encouraging students to speak out, whatever their politics or ideologies are, and then having effective conversations in a classroom setting such that you can have more dialogue and not a lot of piling on of um, one student who feels like he or she is being attacked by others in the class. If someone shares um, a very um, sort of moments of cognitive dissonance where they disagree with another student or they come from a position, maybe a religious or political position that is a minority position, how do we protect the ability to have all those students engaging civically in the classroom context, in a conversation, whether it's happening face-to-face or in the virtual Zoom environment. Social relationships, social capital, social integration is actually directly related to that. The idea that people in a classroom setting, including ourselves as teachers, of course our students, um, can build upon relationships, can have effective social integration. The sociologist Emil Durkheim talked about this in the sense that he said, We have to effectively integrate people in society, not too much, not too little. In the world of Zoom right now, I think that can be pretty challenging right now because people feel like it's not the same as being in a a physical classroom. Okay, this next one is kind of interesting, this idea that um, students may have a perception that education is a form of indoctrination or is heavily left-wing. And I'm not going to get into a big debate about this right now. I can tell you I've studied this this topic, and there are some surprising, some surprising conclusions, actually, that we find where, um, in fact, many universities have individuals, including very prestigious universities, who have a very... Um, right-wing uh, pres- uh, position. Um, you have famous academics out there who make the lecture circuit really right-wing people like Jordan Peterson as an example who certainly represent um, right-wing views and you also have left-wing individuals like Angela Davis. So there's kind of um, a spectrum I would say of people in the academy so I'm not going to get into that debate right now but if students have a perception that something you're teaching them in a classroom is indoctrinating them. If you teach them about um, Marxism in sociology, there's no way to get around teaching Marxism in sociology. It's like a key core of our discipline. But um, you can maybe comfort that student a little bit if they're saying, well, why am I learning about Marxism? I heard these things about Marxism. Sometimes perceptions that students have that we have of certain theories, of certain studies, of certain individuals can be countered just with more information and more openness to engage with those students. Because I think sometimes there is a perception that comes out. I've seen this in the social sciences where someone will say, well, you're teaching me about um, LGBTQ plus issues, or you're teaching me about Marxism, or you're teaching me about social class. Well, yes, that's part of education. And sometimes, you know, we maybe don't want to hear everything that is presented to us in the classroom. But if we develop that questioning spirit that's so important to education, hopefully as students, we will be open to at least listening and perhaps changing our opinions. 
Now that connects to two um, other issues here. One is uh, this idea of outlandish student opinions holding, holding students accountable or protecting them. So if someone says something in a class that's hateful, if you're discussing uh, gay marriage or something like this, or immigration or affirmative action, and a student says something hateful, you don't have to allow that in a classroom. Now, it's really key in your syllabus to define in there, and I have some samples on my uh, syllabus uh, website, so please check that out. I'll, I'll get the link to you if, you if you'd like it. And we have um, codes that faculty have written through the Senate. We also have classroom codes of conduct that faculty have written as individuals for their own classes. So I encourage you certainly to include those in your syllabus to clearly define hate speech. You don't necessarily have to agree everyone in a classroom setting, but you have to agree to disagree constructively, and that's really key. And this is related then, this idea that we should confront hate speech in a classroom setting. And again, reach out if you'd like some samples of the syllabus snippets that have information you can directly incorporate, say, in your winter class. And then this last one I thought was really key. It actually goes back to the initial topics of trauma and stress and apathy and depression is to really confront um, discomfort in different ways. So we might have discomfort right now because of the political climate, because of COVID-19. We also might encourage students, if we're having conversations about anti-racism as connected to BLM uh, discussions at the college and nationwide, sometimes you have to present students with discomforting information as a way of initiating dialogue, transformation in terms of our collective consciousness politically, and social transformations across society. I remember years ago reading one of my first uh, evaluations at LTCC from a student, and, and I always remember it because it, it kind of is a reminder that what the student was saying as a complaint, I actually think is a good thing. And, and what the student says was, um, Dr. Lucas should really warn his students about the dark conversations he has in his classes. And as I reflect on that, I thought, um, I will warn, um, and I've actually done that, but I will continue to encourage discomfort or dark conversations or focusing on contrarian views in a classroom setting, because that's the whole point of higher education. The point is not about comfort. If you turn on the news and you look at poverty, if you look at what's happening even pre-COVID in terms of key social issues, damage to the environment, hate, violence around the world, the growth of authoritarianism, the growth of the regrowth of fascism worldwide. These are important issues to address. They're disturbing issues, but there is a reason that we need to deal with them and confront them. It reminds me a little bit of the conversations going on right now about Confederate monuments in the United States, about slavery, um, all the stuff that's been coming out via uh, pop culture, Lovecraft Nation on HBO, the Watchmen revival on HBO connected to the Tulsa massacre um, many years ago, is really a moment of saying we have to come to terms with the historical past, the legacy of slavery, the le legacy of Jim Crow, the legacy of Native American genocide in the United States, and really deal with this as a nation. It's very reminiscent in terms of what Germans talk about connected to history called uh, Vergangenheitsbewertigung. And this is a period of deep atonement or focus on the past in such a way that you hopefully can prevent similar things from happening in the present or in the future. So I think when we think about the conversations we've been having as a nation in terms of our dark and disturbing history, it's a reminder that actually we need to confront our own collective historical, social, political traumas in the United States in order to grow as a society, in order to grow as communities, as colleges and universities, and as individuals. So certainly focusing on uh, discomfort um, as a possibility of engaging with our students civically is really key because there are a lot of discomforting and terrible things in the world um, of which we need to be made aware of and we need to make our students aware of those things. So uh, that's the end of it today. We'll focus here just on this summary of some of the ideas we talked about in our teaching talk number 31 on civic engagement. Thanks for those of you who attended. If you didn't get a chance to attend, and this goes for everybody. I'd love to see some administrators at these talks, uh, classified staff, directors, and faculty, of course, full and part-time, um, because we certainly have a lot of conversations to have as a community college in terms of these and many other issues. Thanks for listening. I'll be back as usual with another video focused on issues related to LTCC teaching and learning.